Good evening. Good evening. I I am just going to uh, bear with me. How do I do I this? Know. There we go. I'm just going to. I'm just going to mute everybody, please. Sorry, just for the moment. And then I'll stop in the middle and allow for some questions. Um, okay. Okay, it's almost half past. I think we can, I think we can start. Okay, good evening. Thank you for, for joining me. <clears throat> if you, um, I'm not sure whether you, you, any of you have a text in front of you, it would be very helpful uh, if you have, because this is, we are studying a text, and um, especially somebody such as the Ramchal who wrote with tremendous precision. He was a very precise uh, um, Machaber, and he wrote uh, he wrote his work very carefully, and therefore it it behooves us to use his to use his text to use his language carefully. So last week we did a a bit of an introduction, and um, obviously I'm not going to go over that. So this week we're going to start the text proper. Okay, so I will read and translate, um, and then. In a couple of minutes, I'll stop for some questions, but there are some difficult concepts we need to look at this evening. Okay, so, Chelek Aleph, this is part one of the, the Sefer is divided, as we said, into four parts, and he calls this Al Yusoidoi Samatsius, on the, he will discuss the foundations of existence. Existence has foundations. I mean, that's quite a fascinating concept in and of itself. It's quite metaphysical. Metzius the word, is the word that we use for existence. And of course, it is uh, uh, the, uh, the etymology, the source of it is to find. Because to, when you find something, it means a couple of things. It means that this is not this doesn't come about as a result of something that you have worked on or worked for. The concept of finding, by definition, is you stumble on something, you find something. You, weren't, you didn't, as it were, work for it. Something just is. And that's a very important concept. It means that it is um, appreciated, it is perceived, it, it is. There is existence. Things just are. And he's going to talk about how and why and where things come from. We find them. What, is the, what are the roots? Actually, he doesn't use the word roots. Because if he used the word roots, which is the word he uses in the first uh, phrase in Mesilesi Shorim, that would suggest something organic. Uh, this is a yusoid. These are foundations. Foundations are rigid, they are, they're not flexible. They, in fact, they need to be, well, okay, if you hurricane proof a building, you do need to allow for a certain amount of give, but they are yesodos, they are foundations, they need to be, and the depth of the foundations will prepare for the, how high your edifice, how high your building of your Yiddishkeit is going to be. If you have worked on the foundations, the deeper the foundations, the deeper the building. And this really, as an aside, I'm going to throw it in. I hadn't intended to, but as I'm saying it, it I realize it that without being in any way chas v'shalem judgmental, but as we go through life, we're often challenged and that's natural. That's why we're here. We are here to be challenged the way people respond to those challenges. Challenges often, we say in English, they, we say they shake us to the core, depending on how big the challenge is. What will guarantee that our edifice, our, our structure, 
of Yiddishkeit will remain strong? The answer is very simple. It will all depend on how firmly rooted our foundations are. If the foundations are flimsy, if the foundations are, and I'm going to be a little bit controversial here, I'm afraid, if the foundations are airy-fairy, if they are only on the basis of emotions, then when an opposing, when a massive trauma may happen, which might shake somebody emotionally and overwhelm the original emotional basis of our Yiddishkeit, then what do we have left? And I'm not negating the importance of emotions in Avodas Hashem. Of course they are important. We are sentient beings. Those emotions play a large part in who we are, but they have their place in, in, in the sequence. I mean, something I think we mentioned in the Shurim in Elul. Again, I'll just throw it in by the by, but it's, it, it is important in, in, in deeper thought. We have the word Melech, which is to be a king, to be in control, is an acronym for Mayach, Lev, and Koved. Head, heart, and liver, which symbolizes nefesh, symbolizes the, 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 the organs of activity. So we have machshava, dibur, and emotions, and then action. And they need to be in the correct sequence, in the correct order for our Yiddishkeit to be rock solid. We start with the head. And this, we're, we're going to come back to this a little bit later in, in tonight's shear because this is actually a, um, a puzzle, a bit of a conundrum in his language, which we'll come to in a minute. But broadly speaking, we clarify for ourselves what is right and what is wrong. And then the challenge of life is to harness the emotions to be enthusiastic on message, motivated to carry through that which I know to be true. And in that order, in that sequence, mayach lev koved, head, heart, and then action. Then you are a melech, then you're in charge. But if we do it the other way around, if the emotions are in the driving seat and if the emotions are the basis of our Yiddishkeit, then if chas v'shalom, there is a a trauma which shakes us emotionally and overwhelms us, then we're left, we're left with nothing. And therefore, what the limud that we are going to do are yesodos. What are the foundations? And therefore, this is a philosophical work. When I say philosophical, as I said, derech Hashem, as opposed to the Mesilis Yisharim, this is about knowledge. What does a Jew need to know? And those are actually his opening words. And I'm going to segue straight into the, to the opening words. Perak Rishon, Baboira Yizbarach Shemai. We're going to talk about the Creator. May his name be blessed. We call him the Creator. So he's relating to him as a Boire, as a Creator. And he starts off with the following words. Kol Ishmi Yisrael, every man... It doesn't mean as opposed to woman, of course, but kol ishmi Israel, Now, the words here are really important. He doesn't say chayav. He doesn't use the word ob obliged, obligated, even though it could be, and this is something we will discuss, whether emuna is a mitzvah. Is it an obligation? Is it one of the 613 obligations? That itself is a big controversy and a talking point. We'll come back to that. Here, very clearly, the Ramchal sides with the Rambam that it is a mitzvah, although there are problems associated with it, and we'll come back to that. But what does he say? He doesn't say you're obligated. Fascinating. He doesn't say you're obligated. He says, Tzorich. It is a necessity. Every Jew needs two things. Whoops. Yeah. Sheya'amin v'yeda. You, every Jew needs to believe and know, and in that order. So this is, this is a, a vital, in fact, this is the most vital ingredient 
in a Jew's life. You just, it's like he's saying to us, guys, you've got to believe, you've got to know. Not, you're obligated. This is not about some sort of religious obligation, although it may well be. He's going deeper than that. He's saying this is, this is elemental. To be a Jew in the fullest sense of the word, to be an active member of Kalal Yisrael, you need to believe and know that what? Sheyesh Shom Motsui Rishon Kadmon Venitzri. That there is there, and I'm not going to talk about the word there because it's an interesting word. I'm not going to talk about it tonight. I just want to have some mention it. There is Motsui Rishon. There is an entity, Motsui, again that word, that word, Motsui. There is something that is to be found. It doesn't do its justice in English to say an entity. But there is something which is, and this thing is, it has three qualities. It is Rishon, Kadmon, and Nitzchi. We'll come back to those. They are, he, he, uh, this is Hashem who is first, first meaning first of a set. Kadmon, he is the very first, even if there were not to be anything. Nitzchi, and he is also eternal. And we'll talk about these each in turn in a minute. So we need to believe, every Jew needs to believe and know basically that there is a Hashem, but who, in what capacity, what do we have to know? We have to believe and know that there is an entity which is Rishon Kadmon Venetsky. These three aspects, as it were, of his existence are imperative. We need to know them. And, and, Vahu, and it is he, Shehimtsi Umamtsi Kolma Shenimtsa Bamatsius. How many times have we had this, this, this root, this shoresh, mem tzadik aleph, to be found? Yes? I mean, go through it again. The, 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 the chelek aleph is, is headlined, yesodes hamatsios. And then he says, kolish misrael tzorch shayam and vieda, sheyesho motzoi rishon kadmitzri, behu shehimtzi umamtzi kol ma shenimtza bimtzios. No less than five times in the, in the opening sentence, this word uh, uh, manifests in in various ways. And it is Hashem, Shehimtzi Umamtzi. He brought into existence, but he uses the word, he doesn't say Boidre, he says Shehimtzi. He caused it to be, to be found, and that's in the past tense, Shehimtzi. And then he goes on to say Umamtzi. And he, this is in the present tense, not only did he bring things into existence, he continues in the present tense. Again, we'll come back to this. We're going to dissect this, this first opening sentence because it's a big one. What did he bring into existence? Anything and everything. Anything that is to be found, to be observed, any phenomenon, any force. Right? We know there are four main forces in the, you know, the strong and the weak nuclear force and then electromagnetism, whatever it is, anything, time, space, time, anything, anything and everything. He brought them into existence at a point in the past. Again, we can't even say that because a point in the past presupposes time and this is before time. You can't even say, you know, before time, before is also time. So we, above, beyond, he's the cause. He did so and continues to do so. And who is this? Vehu ha eloika baruchu, and this is the God. Ha eloika baruchu, may he be blessed. Whoa, what a what a what a, 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 a an epic opening sentence with so many bits to be dissected. So let's start now to uh, dissect them. Does anybody, you know, I'm happy to unmute people if they want, or you can raise your hand or something. If anybody, if there's anything that's unclear at this stage, um, kind of raise your hand or something. Yes, Rivka, I will. Can you unmute, unmute yourself? I'm not sure. Uh, uh, yes, good evening. Oh. Kavod hi, hi, um, good evening. Yes. So, What's your if, question? Um, if we, we, in the very first sentence, there I've said that it is she amin And do we, do we um, start this process um, with the moyach or with the lev? Okay. Excellent so if we question. Started and, and another question, if, if I might ask it as well, if we started with the Moyach, we, we don't call it uh, Da'at, what we have. We also have Da'at, Be'ezrat Hashem, but we call it Muna. And how does this both 
we'll yeah. all stick together. I, that's exactly thank the you very much. Uh, Thank you for that. Yes, that is exactly what I'm going to address tonight. Definitely. Yes, that is the point really very much, probably going to be the main focus of, of tonight's share. This is exactly the, um, this is kind of the main topic. So let's dive into it. But before we get to that, before we get to that, um, I have to mention this phrase, like I said, sorich, you need. What, what, what does that imply that you need? I'll tell you what I saw one of them for say, and I, I think it's very uh, uh, um, insightful. The Rambam writes, and again, this is really a separate topic, but I'm just going to mention it. Every Jew has a capacity, I use my words carefully, has a capacity to generate a connection to another dimension. I'll say that again. Rabbi Chaim Velozhna points out, it doesn't say every Jew has a, a place in the world to come. In other words, it's not like timeshare, right? You don't own something and, you know, the, 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 this uh, a shimmering palace in the sky and you, you, you just have to somehow find the key to get into it. Open, unlock it through doing a few mitzvahs. No, that's not the way it works. No, no. Kol Yisrael Yeshlahem chelek. We have a chelek. We have a part. Very important word. What does that mean? I like to use the computing metaphor because I think it, for me it just works. I think you, some of you may have heard this from me before. Um, the hardware and the software. The software is the Torah, the operating system, and the hardware is the neshama. And it is the combination of the two. We have the hardware. We are given a very fragile and special and delicate piece of equipment that has the ability, the network card, if you like, that can connect, but it's useless without the operating system. You need Windows, you need an interface, you need a command prompt, and you also need to enter the keys. Those are the mitzvahs, Torah and mitzvahs. And the combination of the two, because you have this chilek, we have the Wi-Fi code, we have the hardware, we have the software, we have the neshama, and we have the, the language of the cosmos. We have the actions which reverberate, which have very real impact. Physical actions which trigger and make ruchniyastika connections, some of which we understand, some of which we don't. And they create, they generate, this is the point, they generate a dimension, a reality, which we will then inhabit for all of eternity. And if we don't do that, nebuch. But there's a number, there is a criterion. Says the Rambam. The Rambam says that if a Jew, and I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm going to give a disclaimer before I say this, because it, it really deserves its own treatment. It's a top, big topic, the parameters of this. If a Jew does not believe and this is where my metaphor to computing breaks down because it doesn't matter your knowledge uh, of you know bill gates and and thing is utterly irrelevant you press the keys and that's it and there is something in that in torah as well but there is one crucial pre precondition and that is you have to accept there are pieces of knowledge that you need to have in order for your activities to create that trigger. There are 13 of them. They are the basis of emunah. The bases of emunah are things you just have to know. You just have to know them. Now you have, you have to believe them. I'll come back to that in a minute, believing and knowing. We'll come into that, but you need to buy into them. And if you are unaware of them, it may be no fault of your own. And this is where it can get complicated and I'm not gonna go into that tonight. In the words of Reb Chaim Briska, Reb Chaim Soloveitchik, forgive me, it's in Yiddish, a nebuchan apikoros is och an apikoros. If somebody is a nebuch, it may be no fault of their own. But if you don't have the Wi-Fi code, that you cannot connect. Now, how and why that is fair and all that sort of stuff, not for tonight. But that, that for us, it's important. And this is what I think the Ramchal is saying. If as the Rambam points out, it means that the condition is that we, there are 13, according to the Rambam, there are 13 
core principles of belief and knowledge, which you must subscribe to in order that when you press those keys, that the connections are made and you create and you generate this chilek in Olam Abba, then these are things you just have to know. Sorich, and I think that's what the Ramchal is saying. Sorich shenamin, you just got to know them. Now, we're not forcing you. We're not compelling you. you but you need, you need to know that you need to know. There are things that a Jew needs to know. Ignorance is, is not bliss. If you do not know these Yud Gimel Midas, Yud Gimel Ekrim, and at the moment we're talking about the very basic one. If you do not accept the existence of a commander, then everything that you do by definition cannot be a mitzvah. What does the word mitzvah mean? Mitzvah is a commandment. Now, a commandment only makes sense if there is a commander. If I don't believe in the existence of a commander, the concept of mitzvah is, is meaningless. So what would be, and I, what would be if I, I choose to be kind and good just because I want to be kind and good? That's a good thing. But it doesn't make it a mitzvah. Reward, and it's not, it's not about reward actually, because the whole concept of reward really in Yiddishkeit hardly exists. It's about the real consequence. It's like the Wi Fi code. In order for that action to be a mitzvah, by definition, at a simple logical level, you have to buy into the concept of a commander. And he commanded us to do X. And then you operate the system. You've got the, the software, you've got the language, you've got the Torah, and you have the the, your, your hardware, you have the, the neshama, and then amazing things happen. You create those connections and you build that dimension of ruchnis which you then inhabit. But if you don't buy into these things, if you do not believe and know, and we'll see, if, then nothing happens. Tzorich sheya'amin v'yeda. And that's, I think, what he means. Now, I'm sure this in itself can generate lots of questions. I'm, I'd rather sidestep them. I'll tell you why. I could, I can give a share on this, but I think it'll take us off topic. It, and I know it's, it's, it's sometimes difficult, but for the moment, let's just accept this concept. Because let's, talk, let's think about ourselves, first of all. We, we as, as Orthodox Jews, as uh, you know, Jews who live the Torah, there are things we need to know. And this is what he's, he's telling us. He's telling us what we need to know. Now, so that's the first point. That's the first word. That was on the word tzarech, need. Now let's move, excuse me, let's move on to the next thing which Rivka quite rightly brought up. Sheya'amin v'yeda. We need to believe and know that there is a God. Now, well, which one is it? Well, let's think about what, is, what does this mean to believe and to know? To believe is to rely on something, to have faith. Generally speaking, the word, uh, when I used to uh, um, give shurim to teenagers and, and I wanted to be a little bit provocative and make sure that they weren't, uh, they weren't sleeping, I, I would say to them, I don't want to hear the F word in my, in my lesson. I was, what do you mean? I said, faith. Yeah, I mean, because what word, in English at least, do we, do we associate with faith? For some reason, <laughs> blind. Blind faith. Now, Jews don't do blind faith. Blind faith is irrational. It makes no sense. Why on earth should I have blind faith pretty much in, in anything? Especially in the existence of something. Can I just, somebody's raised their hand, but I'm going to just finish this point if I may. I, I realize there are lots of questions and I'll try and come to participants and raise their hands. Give me a second. Okay. <laughs> so, again, when we use the word generally, we use the word emuna, it means to just believe something. I want to use a slightly different word because I don't think in this context it means believe, I want to use the word trust. And that already gives us a whole different connotation. To trust that there is Hashem. Trust who? Trust what? We'll come back to that, okay? 
so there is an element of trust. And that's why really emuno is often uh, um, um, contrasted with emes. Emes is that which is clear and um, demonstrable, something which can be demonstrated through evidence. But emuno actually means, the famous uh, uh, um, instance of it is when um, Moshe Rabbeinu is famously uh, holding up his hands in the Melchama with Amalek, and the Possek says, Vayihi Yodov Emuno Ad Boy Hashamish. His hands were Emuno. That's exactly the words of the Chumish. Vayihi Yodov Emuno. His hands were Emuno. Now, hands don't do a lot of trusting, hands don't do a lot of believing. Maybe we'd raise our hands and say, I believe. But the hands, Vayihi Yodov Emuno. What does it mean? It means Emuno means to be true, to remain faithful, to remain on task. His hands, although they got tired and he was holding them up till the end of the day, but his hands remained on message. Emuno, they were faithful. It's ne'emon, it's, emuno is ne'emon, to be faithful to that which you know is true. Now, hold on a second. If that is the case, then I've kind of dug my own grave. Because if I'm saying that Yamin is to remain faithful to something that you already know, then he should have said Yeda first, should he not? You with me? So here we have a little bit of a problem. I, um, you know, two hands were raised, so I am going to actually stop, although I hope I don't lose my, my train of thought. Um, yes, who wanted to ask? I was actually the hand, but I think you're, you're actually answering my question. So I I'm hope just... so. I hope so. <laughs> Give me no, a no, no. before I hang myself. <laughs> no, you're doing, this is exactly what I was trying to ask. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Louise, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So uh, anybody else wanted to add? If you want to may, maybe give me 10 minutes to, to kind of, you know, sketch this out because it is complicated and, and I, I do realize that Allow me, maybe give me a few minutes, unless there's something that at this stage you absolutely don't understand. Okay, we're good? Thank you. Okay, so where are we up to? So we, we've really uh, um, um, extended the concept, uh, concept of emuna to faithfulness, or rather trust. I want to use the word trust in this, in this context, and you'll see why shortly. Okay, the concept of trust. And then yeda is something which you absolutely know. So... We need to believe and know. Let me tell you a question that one of the, um, the greatest Rosh Yeshiva in the last generation, Rabbi Shach Zechreini Levracha, asked his Rebbe, the Briskarov. And he asked him as follows. He asked him, what is the, why is the mitzvah called emunah? Why do we call the mitzvah emunah? Surely, he said, there is a cert certain things which we can work out. Assuming, and this again, this is a subtopic, each of these are very big subtopics, assuming that it is necessary and an obligation, it does become actually an obligation to work out that there is a God as Abraham Avinu did, and as, by the way, it is incumbent on the, uh, those that are not Jewish, a ben, a ben Noach, is obligated to believe that there is a God, even though they don't have Torah. It means that the concept of belief in Hashem is one that is fundamental, and it is obligatory, which means that it has to be, at some level, it has to be evident. And this raises a real... This raises, a, again, another really big, important question. I'll tell you the way the Meshachachma puts it. The Meshachachma builds on an observation from the Chayva Salvovas in the following way. In the physical world, material resources, says the Chayva Salvovas, are available and their cost is relative to their necessity for life. So, that's a Chayva Salvavis, okay? 14th century Spain. The Chayva Salvavis says that those ingredients which are absolutely crucial for life will be, to, will be found in abundance and will be relatively inexpe inexpensive. The less necessary something is 
the less it will be found. And therefore, because of demand and supply, possibly it will be more expensive. So really sorry to say this, and I know I'm slightly outnumbered tonight, but broadly speaking, those useless lumps of carbon that you carry on your fingers are not, are not necessary <laughs> for existence. They're not necessary, right? Diamond rings, they may be forever. They're not, they're not necessary. We need diamonds for it in engineering, to cut things. But this concept, we can live without diamond rings. And in fact, that's why we buy them, because it's the fact that they are unnecessary. They, therefore, they become a token of love. And because of their cost, their scarcity is because they're unnecessary. Let's go to the other end of the scale, air. I know in Switzerland, I do believe there is a Luft tax. <laughs> Trust the Swiss. But, nobody, but generally speaking, I believe air is free. The governments have not yet, uh, they haven't yet taxed it. Although who knows? Yeah, carbon, they're working on it. Okay, so, and therefore it is to be found in abundance because you cannot manage for a few minutes without air. Therefore it's everywhere and it is free. Number two, of course, is gonna be water. Not quite everywhere. We ourselves are 70% water or something and we need water and therefore it is found a lot. It costs a bit more. And then, and then you go. That's the Chavis Haldavas. The Meshachachma says an amazing thing. He transposes this concept to spiritual life. And he says, therefore, that the ingredients that are necessary to sustain spiritual life will be available relative to their need. And therefore, he says, the most basic requirement and ingredient for spiritual life is, all together now, I know you're on mute, emuna. There has to be emuna. Because if you wander around this planet under the deluded idea that you somehow just got here by some random mutation as a, you know, having, having descended from some sort of primate and life is absolutely random and there is no purpose to it at all, then there is nothing more tragic than that. And therefore, he posits that emunah has to be, because it is the most vital ingredient for, to sustain meaningful spiritual life, and therefore emunah has to be available. Which then raises the question, it means therefore that a right thinking individual ought to be able to come to the simple conclusion that there is something that kicked this whole thing off and that therefore becomes obligatory on everybody because it is the most necessary thing for human life. Now, the fact that today it isn't so simple is for a whole bunch of reasons. Society has developed. I mean, let's not forget, by the way, let us not forget, you only need to go back 200 and something years and tap anybody on the shoulder in Christendom, in, in, in Western Europe and, in, in, and say, does God exist? And they, they look at you as if you're, you're nuts. Of course God exists. It wasn't until the 18th century that he was, to quote, put on trial and this whole, this whole other stuff happened. So it, it, was, it was obvious. There was no question per se. Now, it means that it, it may sound crazy to us because today we have the shoe is kind of on the other foot, which is sad and tragic. But to sustain spiritual life, there has to be, there is a muna. There has to be a muna. And if there had, in other words, but then that wouldn't be a muna. That would be something that you would just be able to work out. Therefore, Rabbi Shach asked his Rebbe, the Briskorov, so why is it called a muna? Surely it should just be called Yudia. It should be called knowledge. And the Briskorov said to him, I asked my father, this question, that was Rukhaim, Rukhaim Soloveitchik. And he answered me, and I, I'll quote, I'll read it out over here. He says, Shevadai ad kamo shesechel ha'odom maga'as, of course, that to the extent that a human brain is able to work out at a very basic level that there is a first cause, that indeed is knowledge. Ve'en zu emunah, this is not emunah. Ve'hi yedia, it's a form of knowledge. But... But the obligation of emunah as such begins from the moment, from the limitations, from where 
we, our knowledge finishes. So we may be able to work out that there is a single entity that brought all of this into existence, give it, slap a label on it, call it God. But there is going to, by definition, there is going to become a limit because we are finite and God is infinite. And therefore there will come a point in time where we will hit a brick wall and our knowledge will hit a brick wall. And from that moment on, we will need to trust those who have some experience of something beyond. I've, I've just thrown it out in a sentence and I'll go back and explain it and it will become clearer probably not till next week because he fleshes this out a little bit later. Let's go back. The first thing is trust. And I'm actually going to suggest something a little bit deeper. I'm just going to throw it out tonight. There is actually a, a there is a cycle. It's actually a spiral. There's a, it, it's like a cosmic dance. Trust, or ra- trust, I'm going to call it trust. Trust and knowledge, and trust and knowledge, and trust and knowledge. And one leads to the other. Where does it all start? That's a little bit moot. And this is, there here it becomes a little bit interesting. He says, Sheya'amin Vieda. Let me tell you what I think he means. Because the Rambam appears to contradict himself. The Rambam in one place writes very clearly that you have to believe. In his Sefer HaMitzvah, he writes the mitzvah, the first mitzvah is Laha'amin, to believe. And then when he comes to open his magnum opus, his Mishnah Torah, the very, very beginning, Perak Aleph, Halacha Aleph of Hilchas, Yesodeh HaTorah, he says the mitzvah is Leida, to know. And we actually have two psukim in the Torah, do we not? We have on the one hand, Onoichi Hashem Aleikecha, that is the mitzvah of Emunah, that's the mitzvah that he brings, which it's, it's actually quite strange if you think about it, because that was a moment of incredible revelation. We all experienced Hashem. Onoichi Hashem Aleikecha, hi, here I am. As Rashi says there, as the Medrash says, he's, it, it was the point of greatest revelation that is possible. We plugged into the mainframe, which is why we all died. We bl- just blew our casing. We couldn't, we couldn't take it. It was just too much. We plugged straight into the mainframe and we knew and we experienced Hashem at the highest level. It was even beyond what a, a sort of a human being can experience. The proof is that we, we died and he had to sort of bring us back to life again until we said, <laughs> enough. So, so we experienced it. We knew it. And indeed, in voice Hanan, about this experience, it says, Ato horeso lodaas ki Hashem hu ho'eloikim. You were shown lodaas, to know. We experienced it. So, on the one hand, we are told there was posuk after posuk after posuk, where it's very clear we need to know. Here's another one. Also, again, from verse Hanan, Viodato Hayoim, we say it in Aleinu, Viodato Hayoim, you shall know today, Vahashivaisa El Vavecha, here's the process, and internalize it to your heart. Kiashem Huho Elohim, Vashomai Mimal, Valoris Mitocha Seinoid. So we have these, these, these twin ideas. Das is a very strong theme. And yet the Rambam says, Shayamin. So what's going on? I'll tell you what I think is going on. And <clears throat> very quickly, and that will probably be, I'll probably qu- finish this for tonight. I'm, I'm going to aim and try to try and do sort of 40 minutes, not much more, because uh, I think that's an optimal time. I'd rather leave people wanting to come back rather than getting bored. So the question is as to whether the emunah is itself a mitzvah, is a big machlekas rishonim. There are those that say you can't make emunah a mitzvah because if you don't accept the existence of a commander, then there cannot be any commandments. And if you accept the existence of a commandment, that means automatically, de facto, you accept the existence of a commander. So therefore, the obligation to believe in a commander makes no sense. And that is the opinion of the Halochas Gedolois, um, the Ibn Ezra, Reb Chazdoi Kreskas, whereas the Rambam and the Ramban, and it seems the Ramchal as well, hold it is a mitzvah. So then what is the mitzvah? 
So let's think about, just for a second, um, how do you know? Well, let's think about, if I were to ask you, if you went on mute, how do you know, how do I know that there is a, that Hashem exists? Now, there are two avenues, and these are discussed very much by the Rishonim. There are two avenues. The Rambam mentions it himself, and the Ramchal, a little bit later on in this parak is going to mention it. And I'm going to highlight them now. One is tradition, tradition. Yes? One is because my father told me, and his father told him, and his father told him, and we have a collective narrative, a tradition of a mass revelation, which incidentally can't be smuggled into history at any point, and that's another schmooze. I, as hopefully a semi-intelligent human being with an independent brain, have a very simple choice. Do I trust my father? Do I trust my teachers that what they are saying is actually the truth or is, God forbid, some delusional, as Dawkins would say, as some crazy myth that has grown up, documentary hypothesis, whatever. I mean, there's so many different, <laughs> you with me? I have that choice today. As I read more, as I learn, or maybe I shouldn't. But do I, do, what, what, what is the starting point? Says the Ramchal, the starting point is trust. And it's absolutely fascinating. If you think about it, and again, I don't want to go into the psychology of it, but trust is one of the most fundamental uh, uh, um, faculties for, I mean, society can't, can't run. Nothing could run if there wasn't trust. When I get into a taxi, I have to trust that the, the taxi driver isn't drunk or, or on drugs or, or when I go to a professional. If we didn't, in fact, that's where the markets, you know, credit is from the Latin word credo, which means trust. Fiduciary is fidelity. The, 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 every society only operates because we trust people. Who do we learn trust from? Our parents. We are an incredibly intelligent mammal, and yet we are dependent on our parents more than any other creature on the planet for the longest, even down to the, the modern phenomenon of the hotel and of mum and dad. They feed us, they clothe us, they look after us until we are well into our teens, twenties, whatever it is. And we learn by experience that there are people that we can trust. And that is why Kibbut Avvaim is on the side of the Ben Adam Lamokim. It's the last one, it's the bridge. And that is, now that doesn't mean in and of itself that therefore what my father told me is true because there will be a Christian father that will tell his kid something and he should trust him. So of course, you have to look at what is it that he is saying? What makes it different? You do have to use your brain a bit. Of course you do. But fundamentally, you need to open your eyes and look around and see what is being sold to you. Is it credible? Is it worthy of is it worthy of trust? Knowing that we had a Vilna Gorn, a Rambam, looking at the tradition, looking at the chain, looking at everything, of course there's an element of trust. And that is where we start with. The starting point is we trust. Tzorich sheyamin. You've got to trust. But, v'yeda. You also have an obligation to take that trust and to the extent that one is able to make it accessible with your brain as well now to what extent that is again that's something we'll talk about a little bit next week so i think i'm going to wrap it up here we've done 45 minutes i'm going to quickly review do a quick plenary and i will take i will take questions if there are any okay i know we haven't even finished the first sentence but 
it's, I think it's worth doing properly. Okay, so again, we've spoken about the Kol Ishmi Yisrael, I believe is a parallel to the Kol Yisrael, Yesh Lahem Chelek. And therefore, Tzorech means it is, it is necessary. This is something that is necessary to be aware of the operation of the hardware and the software. You've just got to know these things so that when you do a mitzvah, you are making those connections. What is it that we need? Ya'amin v'yeda. There is a, um, ya'amin is, we, we're going to define as trust. To believe, to trust that my, what my parents are telling me and looking at that collective tradition, I trust that it is true. But on top of that as well, v'yeda. To the extent that I have a brain and I'm obligated to use it, I will do that as well. But it's not blank slate. That's why he starts off, he says, you start off with emunah. You don't start off with blank slate. You start off with emunah, v'yeda, and then to the extent that we're able to objectively work out the things that we are able to, and then here Rab Shach's point comes in, the, the Rab Chaim's point comes in. They will, you will hit a brick wall at some point. And then from that moment on, trust takes over. But you know what? We don't just, we don't just stop. We keep learning and then we move. We inch that wall slightly back and what until now was emunah now becomes das because I know more, I've learned more, I understand more. I've delved deeper and now it's more solid. It's not blind. It's not blind. It's trust. But it also has a very strong component of das, of knowledge, stuff that I understand, stuff that I can explain, stuff that there's so much that makes sense. There is so much. The, the depth and brilliance and beauty of Yiddishkeit is immense. It's awesome. I like to say the story very quickly, and with this I'll finish, and then I'll take questions. The story of Rabbi Uri Zohar, who... Kanina Har is in his 80s now. He was in his time, he was the darling of the media establishment. He was the film idol. He was the comic. He's brilliant. He was charismatic. He was the, the, the darling of the secular uh, Israeli establishment. He was the A-lister. And he was very clever, but very bored. He writes in his autobiography, he would go and steal art off the walls of his friends' villas just for the kicks, just to get some kicks. And he became from at the age of 40. And when he was interviewed by Israeli TV not that long ago, at his 80th birthday, and they said to him, you're so young, you look so young. He says, well, I'm only 40. <laughs> only lived 40 years. He's been through Shas, he's a Talmud Chacham, he's an incredible individual. Do you know what made him from? He wandered into a little shul in Tel Aviv once because a, fr a secular friend of his said, look, I've got, I'm secular, but I've got a yacht, yacht site for my father and I'm gonna you know, find a mincha and say, say Kaddish. And he wandered into a shul and there was a little rabbi, well, I don't know if he was little, but whatever. He was, saying, <laughs> he was, he was giving a, a, a little Dvar Torah before mincha. And it was the Vilna Gorn's four shot him on the second posuk in Shira Shirim, Yishokeni Minashikos Pihu. And he began to just peel back layer after layer after layer of depth and meaning in the text conceptually and he said he was blown away he knew he had just experienced and connected with something that was deep and real and true he didn't know what it was he said that we've been sold a lie we were told that judaism is just a bunch of old wives tales nothing in it, no depth no beauty no brilliance no profundity no depth of thought and that was it job done he then just went away and found out the rest so that is not blind and it's not faith. It involves trust. Of course, there is trust involved. But we keep learning. We never stop learning. The fact that you're out here in, in cyberspace wanting to learn on a dreary Wednesday evening in November, that's who we are. That's Klal Yisrael. We keep learning. We keep pushing that wall back. What until now was Emunah now becomes Das. And the, and the dance continues. The spiral continues. And, the, and when we're doing that, we're digging the Yisoidus, the depths of the foundations of our edifice so that when we're challenged, we're able to withstand the challenge. I will stop here for tonight. I will gladly take any questions. Uh, are you all muted? Is that the problem? Uh, how do I do this? Uh, uh, give me a second. I have a question. Ah, yes, please. I, I unmuted myself. I'm sorry. Yeah, sure. This is very brief. It's a little personal in the sense of 
I'm not sure if it'll apply to anybody, but I personally, I when I learned more or less a similar definition to what the Rav said in terms of what emuna is really in a in our you know context, it it, it, um, it not being. Hello. I'm, I'm there. Someone else is talking, but I don't yes. know. Um, but anyway, and it not being uh, what you call it, it not being faith in that in the English sense of the word, but rather yes. being and rather being faithfulness also. And um, I kind of in my head think of it as the place where you're saying there's is it okay? Is it I'll be gorgeous, basically is what I'm asking. To think of it as um uh like the fact that you know if you're having a philosophical discussion in the end you can never really get past the skeptic like there's always like the skeptic always wins but then you know there's you you don't go with the skeptic because that's really boring and annoying and doesn't get you anywhere so is that more or less what we're saying here or is this this is that too far over into the secular world to be useful you know what i mean uh, okay um, Okay, no, I, I get your point, very valid point. Let me rephrase it. When we have, uh, um, let's say you, you, you are uh, um, cognitive, let's talk about cognitive dissonance, okay? Which is the concept of where I am emotionally not ready to hear something, essentially. Okay, so let's say, for example, <laughs> I like to give the example of a perhaps a Satma Chosid bursting into my house now or coming into my house and saying, Roberts, you're such a shake. It's you wear a tie. You, you, you've got a short beard. You, you know, you, you're this is not the way you're meant to be Jewish. You have to wear a furry dead animal on your head and you've got to do also whatever. It doesn't matter. It doesn't really matter. Am I going to listen? No. Why? I'm not ready to listen. I don't care. Really sorry. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean objectively this guy is right or wrong. It's not the point. The point is, I am not in a place emotionally. Before you are ready to absorb and assimilate information, there has to be a psychological state of mind where you're ready to contemplate. Maybe. You know, when, when a Christian and a Jew, for example, let's say a missionary and a rabbi get into a dialogue, I've never understood the point of these things. They are utterly, utterly counterproductive. Nobody, I think, has ever in the history of mankind been changed by these sort of things. Because I'm, I'm not going to become a, an evangelical, and he ain't going to become an Orthodox Jew. It's highly unlikely. And therefore, actually, if you, let's take a step back and let's think about the process of outreach, which I have had the merit as Chus of being involved in many years ago. How does it work? It's very simple how it works. It, what happens is you, you create a setting, an environment, where people are ready to listen. That's all it is. So you do it over a Shabbos, and Shabbos works its magic. What are you doing? All you're doing is you're getting them to lower their emotional guard and their cognitive dissonance, and then you hit them figuratively with the, the, the academic, with, with, the, with, the, with the, the intellectual aspect of it. The point of the Shabbos experience, besides any ruchniastic aspect of it, is just to allow somebody, should they so wish, to lower their guard and be ready to listen. That's it. That, so that is the point. So when you say, um, Louise, when you say, when you talk about the uh, talking to a skeptic, whether the skeptic is yourself or another, it, 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 there is an emotional, yes, it is an emotional state to be prepared to trust my parents. I'm, I'm prepared to be, so to speak, vulnerable in this relationship and be prepared to take certain things on trust. That's why Torah, by the way, Torah is meant to be taught primarily by a parent. Why? Because this is somebody who has demonstrated that they are there for you. They don't have their own interests. That's the way, at least the way it's meant to be. They're altruistic. They've changed every dirty nappy you had. They put up with all your mm, -mm from the word go. And, and they're there for you, no matter what. They brought you into this world in love and they look after you and they care for you. And then they say, you know, there is something really, really important and that's called God. And I'm telling you, not because I'm evangelizing you, but because I love you and I genuinely want you to, to have that which I deeply feel is the, the truth and the best thing, because I love you. I want to teach you Torah, not because I have some sort of religious obligation to teach you Torah, but because I love you. Torah is truth, and I wish you, as my child who I love, 
to have access to and to live by that which is good and true. So, and so it sounds like you're saying Nehmanos isn't, in this context, isn't so much about, or Emuna in this context, isn't so much actually about that philosophical aspect. That falls under the Das category more. It sounds Correct. like what you're saying this is the Lev, like what uh, Rivka Borobiev was speaking about earlier. Correct. The Lev and that would be the Moyak. Okay. Correct. Thank you. That's, that's, Does that make sense? Yeah, thanks. And then we get, and then we get to a point. Okay, I'm ready to listen. Now I'm not going, not just going to take everything. Of course, I trust Hazal. It makes sense. I believe it. But I'm now going to go away and spend the rest of my life learning. Naase, we first say this is always the circle. We say Naase. I'll do it. I buy it. I get it. I accept. I bind my colours to the mast. But I'm not just going to leave my brain and, and, and personality at the door. I'm now going to spend the rest of my life vanishma, trying to hear, trying to understand, trying to relate to it, trying to deepen my understanding, because that is what then it becomes internal. The Yodata Hayoim, which in this case is the, the Amuna, the Hashivo Selvavecha, and, and, and the dance continues, and you deepen it as you go along. It's, a, it's an ongoing cycle. Okay? Everybody good? Okay, we made Okay, I'm glad. We've made, so we've made a good start. Thank you. Thank you for joining me. Um, this, I will put this up on, on, on YouTube, um, unless I have any objections, um, but I'll probably make it unlisted so people can see it if they want. Uh, thank you so much. I look forward to joining you next week. Feel free to email me or ask me any questions in the meantime, um, and I'll try and get back to you. Take care. Thank you for joining me. Have a very good evening. Call to, bye. Bye, bye.